Go ahead, if you will, and open your scriptures to Psalm 119. Psalm 119. Yeah, we're going to start verse 1 and go all the way through 69, 169, and man, it's a long time. No, we will not do that. <laughs> verse, we'll start in verse 9, and we'll see about that. All right? <clears throat> I'm glad you're here. I'm thankful to be here. God is a good God, isn't he? Glad you folks have put up with us. Um, in our last study, which, uh, in which we studied Holy Scriptures, uh, We were looking at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. I want to read that, and I want you to stay where you are in, in Psalms, but I want to read that and sort of try to bring our thoughts back together uh, as we uh, get ready to look at our final part of this study tonight. When you think about the Scriptures... There's a number of things that you can think of. Let me see if I can just uh, read off some notes that I made 30, 40 years ago on this and uh, uh, something for you to go by. Number one, uh, when you think about stability, think of the scriptures. Number two, when you think of worthiness of anything, above all, think of the worthiness of the scriptures. And number three, think of the uniqueness of Scripture. Now, when you say the word unique, we use it in a general term, and it doesn't mean in general term what it means technically, and technically it means it's the only one of its kind, nothing else in the world like it anywhere. And that's the way I'm using it here. The Scriptures are unique. Okay, in addition to that, you need to think of the Bible as being supernatural. It is a supernatural book. And by the way, any one of these things that I'm reading off is just an outline of a little book that I put together many years ago and uh, uh, a lot of things to be said about them. Number one, it is a supernatural book. Number two, it is a superior book. Okay? I'm thankful for good literature. Uh, we also have some not so good literature, but I'm thankful for good literature. But all of the good literature combined cannot compare with the superiority of the Word of God. And the final thing in relation to that, it is a sovereign book. No other book and match it anywhere. And what it says, and this is where the word sovereign comes in, what it says is final. Okay? Now then, so one other set of thoughts that you need as we open this study tonight. Study the Bible to know the triune God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Study the Bible to know Him. Number two, Study the Bible to know yourself. You ever heard someone say, I'm just out trying to find myself? The best place to find yourself is in the Word of God. By the way, once you find yourself in the Word of God, you'll find there's some corrections that need to be made. There's some things that need to be fixed. And by the way, the Scriptures will not only show you where you are, but how to get where you ought to be. So study the Scriptures to find yourself, to find and know the living God, and also study the scriptures to know the doctrine of the Word of God. Okay? And uh, several other things, but that's all I need to, to, cover at that, to cover at that point. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, for years have been uh, two of my very favorite scriptures. 
And the reason is they remind me that I have something stable, something real, something for sure that I can depend on and follow as far as directions are concerned in my life. This is what it says. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Now, if you have a translation that says all Scripture that is given by inspiration of God, that translation is not a good translation to read at that point. Because it, in, it, it ends, ends up saying there may be some Scriptures that are not inspired of God. And that's not what the Scriptures say at all. So, all Scripture is inspired by God, or given by God, and all Scripture is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, know what to believe, know how to correct yourself, get corrected, for Oh, by the way, the word reproof has to do with conviction. The Holy Spirit will use the Word of God to just cut right into your heart where you are. Okay? Then when it does that, <clears throat> the Word of God is profitable for correction. It will show us where we're wrong, but it doesn't leave us there. It tells us how to fix the problem. And then finally, it is also... <clears throat> Profitable for instruction in righteousness or instruction, if you will, in right living. Now verse 17 follows up with that, with a that, or so that. The man of God or the person of God, the believer, may be <coughs> complete, thoroughly equipped, for every good work. I really wish we had time to just delve right into that verse alone. I am simply going to say that this verse says that whatever eventuality you face in your life, God's Word will prepare you for it if you are into the Word. A lot of things happen in this crazy world that we're living in. But it's God's Word that makes sense for us in this messed up world. So <clears throat> whatever you're facing, whatever you'll ever face, God's Word has the answer that you need for that situation. I urge you to make it a habit to stay in the Word. Uh, you can't go wrong by being in the Word, but by being out of the Word, you will go wrong. Okay? And I'll sort of sum that part of it up by saying that one's view of God will indeed affect his view of Holy Scripture. Now, the converse of that is also true. One's view of Holy Scripture will affect his view of God. Get it right. Get the Scriptures right. Get your relationship to the Scriptures right. And it'll help you make sure you're right in relation to everything else. Now, I want us to look at the Scripture that I gave you beginning at verse number 9 in Psalm number 100. 19. By the way, Psalm number 119, all of you are aware, number one, that it is the longest uh, quote-unquote chapter of the Bible. It's not a chapter, but it's a particular individual psalm. But uh, anyway, uh, it's the longest quote-unquote chapter in the Bible. There's also something else unique about this psalm. In every verse in this psalm, 100, what is it, 69 verses? Am I correct on that number? Uh, pretty close. In all of those verses, in every one of them except perhaps one, and that's questionable what I'm about to say. 
all of those verses contain something about the Word, something about Holy Scripture. Okay? Uh, so let's, let's read that. Um, verse number 9. How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to your word. We're going to come back and look at one or two of these individually a little bit later, but right now, how can a young man, a young person, if you're concerned about the, the, the female, male aspect, it's having reference to every human being, whether lady, whether man or lady, female or male. So, how can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to your word. Take heed to how, what your way is like. Make sure it's in keeping with the word of God. That's how to cleanse it. Number two, verse 10. Verse 10 With my whole heart I have sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. Verse 11, your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. That's probably one of the verses you memorized early on in your Christian life. Thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against God. Verse number 12, blessed are you. And that blessed are you simply means God, you, you deserve praise. So, blessed are you, O Lord, teach, my, teach me your statutes. In other words, O Lord, you deserve praise. Teach me your statutes. Number 13, with my lips I have declared all the judgments of your mouth. And verse 14, I have rejoiced in the way of your testimonies as much as in all riches. And I'm putting that in bold print. Whether it's houses, lands, automobiles, bank accounts, stocks, bonds, jobs, whatever it is, I have rejoiced in the way of your testimonies more than all of those. And we could go ahead and say all of those combined. Because that's the impact of what the psalmist is saying. Now verse 15. I will meditate on your precepts. And <clears throat> contemplate or gaze on. I'll meditate. Contemplate on your ways. This is a, by the way, notice that it says your ways, God's ways. <laughs> you realize that God has a behavior? Uh, we used to say to our kids, and now we jokingly say to one another, behave yourself. God has behaviors as well. And the psalmist said, I will trust in, I will contemplate, I will think about, I will gaze upon your ways. How does God act? Follow that. Verse 16, and this is the final of those verses, the final section of that particular uh, set, of, uh, set of verses. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. And the impact of this is I will not ever forget your word. So the impact of this promise to God is both present and it is continuing. And it's a promise, by the way. That particular verse is a promise. It says, I will, I will just follow you and I'll think about you and I'll live for you. Now, <clears throat> as we think about studying the Holy Scriptures, uh, we are taught to um, study the scriptures, 
to do what? Unto God, a workman who what? Does not need to be ashamed, doing what? Rightly dividing the word of truth. That's the second Timothy chapter 2.15. Now let's, <clears throat> let's go back through that. <clears throat> Study the scriptures to show yourself approved unto God, rightly dividing the word of truth. My goodness. Think that verse over a little bit. It covers a whole world of ramifications and how we study the scriptures and how we act as believers and what we do in our service to, the, to God. And by the way, there's a very simple but powerful truth here. When we study the scriptures and when we teach the scriptures, we need to do it in a way that is rightly dividing the scriptures. Let me point something out, folks. You know this. I don't have to say it, but I'm going to go ahead and do it. Um, you, you can't make the Bible teach whatever you may want it to teach. Now, you may make it say whatever you want it to say, but you can't make it mean whatever you may want it to mean. We are to stake, take the scriptures and study the scriptures. Jeremiah says we're to do it line upon line. Here a little, there a little. In other words, the totality of scriptures teach us the truth of God. You don't find the total truth of God in one verse, one chapter, one book. But from Genesis to Revelation, you find the totality of who God is, what he's like, and what he's all about. So there is a constant need for us to be studying the scriptures. Uh, I'm amazed. <clears throat> I, of course, I, I admit that I'm, I'm a slow learner. But I'm amazed at the many times I can read over a passage of scripture and come back and read it again and find something in it I never saw before. That doesn't mean it wasn't there. It just means that Millard Sasser in his own spirit and his own relationship with God was not prepared to receive what God had been trying to tell me all along. By the way, the Bible does say that the Word of God is a what? Living Word. In other words, it, uh, it just keeps on giving. So it's very important for believers to study God's Word. And, and let me give you now a just a few facts about the Bible as you study it so you have some, something to go on. Facts concerning the Bible. the Bible. The Bible claims that God is its ultimate author. Now you notice that I said ultimate. And you'll see, you'll see where I'm going in just a moment. Uh, when we speak of God as the author of the scriptures, we're talking about its integrity, its inerrancy, and its authority. When we talk about the talk about the author of scriptures, God, and God being its author, we are talking about the integrity of the scriptures. Because if you bring in, if you bring into question the integrity of the scripture, you bring into integrity, you bring into question the integrity of what the author of the scriptures. So when you think about the author of the scriptures, you're thinking about its integrity, its inerrancy. If God is God and God who is God cannot lie, then his word is total truth. And then also we think about the authority of scripture. If God said it, that settles it, whether I believe it or not. You used to, there was that little ditty that went on for a long time, God said, I believe it, and that settles it. No, that's not true. God said it, and that settles it, whether I believe it or not. Now then, if God said it, and I believe it, that settles it for me. Praise the Lord. We just need to get our wording right. Okay. So all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable and useful for all those things we went over earlier. 
the Bible is of dual authorship. Earlier I talked about uh, the ultimate author. Now we're talking about the dual authorship. In other words, God is the divine author, and the people who wrote the scriptures were, quote unquote, his secretaries. Now there's another word for that, but you'll understand that. A stenographer, perhaps. He wrote it, he said it, they wrote it like he said it. So we have both the divine and the human. And by the way, God did use each writer out of his own context, out of that writer's own context, out of that writer's own life and own lifestyle. That's why you have different styles of writing in the scriptures. So God took the man, didn't make a cookie cutter and cut out the writers like, he, like that. He took the men as they were even in their imperfections, and I'm going to say more about that in just a moment, and then gave us a perfect word to live by. Isn't that amazing? Uh, he gave us his message through very imperfect men. In fact, history records some of the uh, terrible imperfections through some of the people, or of some of the people, that God used to write. The one that automatically comes to mind when I see that is a man called David. No way could a person look at David and say he was a perfect man. I, I don't think you could say that Peter was a perfect man. <laughs> I don't think you could say Paul was. In fact, <clears throat> two of the disciples, you'll tell me who they were, were called sons of thunder. It wasn't because they were so loud. It wasn't because their daddy hollered so loud. It was because they were so quick-tempered. And by the way, being quick-tempered will get you in trouble. You need to let the Holy Spirit fix that problem for you. And that's not always an easy fix either, I can guarantee you. And you don't need my guarantee on it. You just need God's word on it. Right? But <clears throat> uh, a, a hot temper will get you in trouble with God, <laughs> with your spouses, with your children, with your parents, with just about anybody. So we have a holy God, a perfect God, using imperfect people to write his perfect word. I told you, I uh, mentioned to you some time ago in this study that there are no mistakes in those original transcripts. God said it, they wrote it, it was right. And I think I went through the process that if a scribe was transcribing the Bible, the Old Testament, and he gotten all the way through until the last sentence and made a mistake in that last sentence of the Old Testament he was writing, you know what he did? Did he tear up the last page and start over? No. He tore up everything and started all over again. God intended for us to have his perfect word. Oh, listen, folks. You can trust what God says. You absolutely trust what God says. God placed his hand on fallen men just as he places his hands on fallen people today. Listen. When Sunday school teachers stand before their classes to teach, when preachers stand in the pulpit to preach, when witnesses stand before others to witness, they're not standing there as perfect human beings. 
But if they're really committed to the Lord, they're standing there as people on whom God has placed his hands. And we need to at least give them a hearing. Because God can use most, the most imperfect person to give us a perfect message for that moment. So God placed his hands on them. He places his hands on us today to take that perfect word and pass it on. Second Peter chapter 1, verses 16 through 21, let me read that to you. Uh, the two verses that I'm really looking for are 20 and 21, but there's some things leading up to it that will help us. Peter was writing about the Scriptures and about God and about God's writing the Scriptures. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 through 21 says, For we, that, and he's talking about the apostles here now, okay? Peter says, We the apostles did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Catch that? Peter said, I saw with my own eyes what I'm about to tell you about. Verse 17, for he, that is Jesus received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Verse 18. It goes back to the apostles. There were only three of them, by the way, in this group. And we, you want to remember who they are? Know where we're going? Peter James, and John. Peter, James, and John. And we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. Let me go ahead and interrupt here by referring you to Matthew chapter 17, the Mount of Transfiguration. Okay? Take that and read it with this. Verse 19. So we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you will be well to take heed as lights that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your heart. Having understanding, having problems understanding the word, having, under problem, having problems understanding what God really wants us to learn. He said, you'll do well to take this scripture and if, if nothing else, just store it up until the day dawn, they start dawns. You know who he's talking about? Jesus. Jesus. Until Jesus just shines right into your heart. Mm -hmm. You'd do well to just take the scriptures as you read them, as you've learned them, if you can't do anything else, and just keep them there and wait on the Lord to open it up and put a bright light right in the middle of it. Verse 20. Now then, here, is, here, here are the verses. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. Verse 21, for prophecy did, never came, did not come by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved, or as I mentioned, I think last time, carried along by the Holy Spirit. Verse 20, Knowing this first, that no scripture, no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. There's a number of ways to interpret that verse, and all of them have a, have a touch of truth. Number one, the prophet could not imagine this prophecy. It wasn't his own imagination. Number two, I cannot take this passage of Scripture and just apply my own interpretation to it. You ever heard somebody say, now then tell me what this verse says to you? Be careful. 
Because I'll tell you what, I've heard some people give me some strange stuff that it says to them. What we need to know is not what this scripture says to you, but what does this scripture say to us from God? You get the picture? So, knowing this, that the prophets didn't just sit down one day and try to write a novel and hear what, here's what they came up with. No. And when I sit down to read it, I can't read it as a novel. I can read it as a letter from the living God of glory. Now, we go back. And we looked at, I'm just, I'm just going to refer you back again to Matthew chapter 17. I'm not going to take the time to read all of those verses to you. But it's about the first nine verses of chapter 17 of Matthew and it refers directly to what Peter is talking about that I've just read to you. What I want to get to your attention with is this truth. God has given us a book, directions, that we must follow if we want, number one, his salvation. Number two, we want his blessings in our salvation. And number three, we want his power for service in his salvation. We must follow the book. Now, let me give you just three or four things about the book. Uh, <clears throat> It's indeed, it's indeed, the Bible is indeed a divine library. You've probably heard some of this before. Uh, after all, what I've written down in this little book that I'm talking about is, whew, I'm not even going to tell you how old it is. Anyway, uh, it is written by some 40 different authors. Now, they were all Jewish. But all... 40, 40, write it, 40, 39, 41, different authors, okay? Now, they were all written in the same year, is that correct? Huh? No, you're right. Uh, they were written over a 1,500-year period. Now, think about that in relation to the Constitution of the United States of America. What is it now about how many years old? Yeah, less than 300 years old, right? And we're already fussing over it. Have been for a long time, and I'm not getting political here. I'm just telling you that when man writes something, we can always find a problem with what he's written. Okay? But in this Holy Scripture that was written over a period of 1,500 years, they are in total sync. They came from different cultures. They came from different backgrounds. They came from different circumstances. They came from the, uh, the, the, the um, uh, poverty hovels, pe from peasants, all the way to king's palaces. Those were the writers of this book. Jerusalem was the center city of the scriptures. But here's something far more important. Jesus Christ is the central figure in all 66 books. Even the books that, doesn't, that don't mention him in any prophetic way And uh, for an example, Esther doesn't even mention the word prayer in her book. And yet when you read the book of Esther, you can, see, you can see Jesus just coming through it as you study it. Solomon is, an unusual, Solomon is an unusual book. But as you read the book of Solomon, you see Jesus Christ shining through it all the way. The point to be made is, Jesus Christ is the central figure. 
from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. He is the central figure. And oh, by the way, he's our Savior. <laughs> uh, and God never left his people without a witness. Let me just give you a few things. Number one, from the garden all the way to Joshua, God spoke personally to individuals who passed his message on to those who would listen. Oh, would you like to, would you like to think about the, the magnificence of how God handled, handled those early days? Just think of the ages of the people. How old was Adam when he died? Remember? 900 plus years. And he could personally tell his sons and his sons and their sons and so on right down for 900 years how God did it. Think that over. Now then, you, you can just go through the whole list of things and God gave a personal witness all the way through. Now then, second, however, from Joshua all the way through the rest of the Old Testament, God spoke through the prophets. Third, even though, even through those silent 400 years, God spoke the Old Testament through the priests. God didn't show up on the scene for 400 years, but he spoke to the people through the prophets, or through the priests of the Old Testament. Number four, from the birth of Jesus and onward through the New Testament, God spoke through his son and the apostles. And from Pentecost onward until Jesus comes again, he is speaking to the world through us, the church. My, we have a fantastic heritage, don't we? We really do. So God's word is your final hope, your final authority, and the final message that we need. How shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed to what it says.